Hi, I'm Debbie Howard, chairman of the Carter Group and co-founder of the Living Best Professional Community. Today, we'll be hearing from Stephen Johnston. Stephen is a fellow in the Healthy Longevity area at Sampo Digital Lab, and he's also founder of Ford Castle, an impact-focused consultancy working at the intersection of innovation and impact. He curates the Looking Forward newsletter. Stephen is co-founder of Aging 2.0, which was acquired in 2022, and a co-author of Longevity Ecosystems, which is coming in the future from MIT. He studied economics at Cambridge University and has an MBA from Harvard Business School, where he was a Fulbright Scholar. Our thanks to Stephen Johnston for being with us today. Ecosystem is really one of my favorite words, and to, I overuse it so much that my wife gives me a hard time um, because it's a bit of a cliche. So I think the reality is that right now, ecosystem is an uh, extremely important word and concept for those in aging and longevity to, to grasp. And I think we've moved away from the siloed um, development of solutions and products. And and I think it was what was my first decade in aging was was, was setting up Aging 2.0, where we ran that um, together with Katie Fike for the last uh, 10 years. We sold it uh, a couple of years ago to Louisville Healthcare CEO Council, and now sort of have, have moved on. But essentially, that was in response to a lack of ecosystem thinking and a lack of small projects, well-meaning often, non-profits often, but not really engaging with the, the technology industry, not really engaging with the sort of scale that we need to really make a difference. And so since um, Leaving Aging 2.0, I've really been, um, if you like, gone from ideas and discussion to implementation. And this is essentially the next decade. And I've got three buckets uh, of, of work, which don't necessarily respond exactly to my to my time commitment, but um, broadly. So the first is Sompo, uh, which is really why I'm spending time in Japan. And that has um, been a, uh, Sompo has been a partner of mine um, in a crowd of mine for the last five or six years. I met them through Aging 2.0, a fascinating company, really shifting um, themselves from a nursing home, insurance and nursing home business into a wellness um, and business and, and a really uh, and wellness and data business over the next um, decade or so. And so they've got big, bold ambitions, like Japan-centric um, right now in terms of their primary business activities, but really global ambitions. So working out of um, Foster City and Silicon Valley with Albert Chu and the team in the Silicon Digital, um, Silicon Valley Digital Lab. Um, and that gives me essentially an insight into the insurance world, nursing and well, then the evolution of that from a sort of um, uh, how businesses run today. Um, the second piece is working with Institute on Aging um, out of San Francisco, which is a big nonprofit. Um, and they are, fascinating in the transition period, doing digital transformation, uh, bringing in pilots, running tech talks, um, creating a caregiver innovation hub in their beautiful space in the Presidio. And that's working with a very hardworking sort of cutting edge um, frontline organization, working with people with dementia, people who are uh, often um, a lower income and running a bunch of programs from PACE programs to community programs to um uh private uh home uh private duty home care um and also this day, dementia day center in the presidio so that's a wonderful it's like a, a convening point for innovation with a with a central focus in silicon valley and i'm bringing them um ideas and, and, and startups and, and, and perspectives from around the world and then my third uh hat if you like is looking forward which is my newsletter uh which is my sort of side project my nights and weekends um, and that is a uh, really a response to the fact that I I love to write enough to sort of to think out loud, and so it's, it's a newsletter, but it's also sort of evolving into essentially a systems change um, sort of commentary around the space with healthy longevity and systems change as its two main um, sort of uh, perspectives. So I'm spending a lot of time looking at global uh, efforts around um, systems change and longevity, and spending quite a lot of time right now on things like behavior change, where if we're going to see significant impact and significant change 
in longevity um, for the long term uh, at a systems level, we need to really bring um, the behavior change uh, perspective. And uh, McKinsey has a has a nice report out um, that 19 of the top 23 factors influencing healthy longevity are non-clinical and modifiable. And that essentially means that we can do a lot ourselves to deliver healthy aging for our and longevity for ourselves and our communities and our families. Um, and that's requiring a very different mindset. So a lot about what I'm doing in my third bucket is trying to find um, intervention points that we can work strategically um, and smartly to make um, inputs to uh, to affect a broader systems change. I think there's some uh, good conversations to be had around how do we define age tech? And you know, I've been in this space for 10 years and I'm still not really sure uh, how to define it because I think one of the things that I, um, I've been looking at is that so much of the things that we need to see and to change are nothing to do with what we could consider age tech. We're talking about revolutionizing the financial system, changing our transportation, how we design our cities, thinking through our uh, social compact to connect older and younger people together in in new and interesting ways and so I do actually have a bit of a I kind of get, I'm going to get stuck a little bit on this time when we sort of um, when we talk about age tech but it can be a little niche and I think my whole ethos uh, is really sort of thinking and taking a bit of a step back and looking at what really matters right now in the world and that is you know climate change and demographic change and sort of to this massive changes and at the same time we've got this institutional um a crisis in terms of democracy and um, the fact that our governments and our institutions are not running how they should. And I think this is all connected. I think if we look at the climate crisis and how that impacts uh, healthy longevity, you know, it was all intimately connected there. So I think we need to look a bit broader than just the sort of world that many of us sort of inhabit. But I think there are some cross-cutting trends and themes um, that are universal. And I think you know, it's hard to go anywhere without AI being part of the conversation right now, especially when you're looking at startups uh, and tech. And, you know, I am generally bullish on, on technology and I think there is a wonderful opportunity to apply some of this cutting edge technology to do some uh, leapfrogging. This was something that in my previous role at Nokia, we looked at technology in Africa and we were helpful in helping bringing uh, mobile wireless uh, to support uh, communities in Africa that didn't have wired uh, infrastructure. And lo and behold, we saw a significantly improved experience for individuals, for users using things like mobile payments well before we in the States or Europe had come to that because we didn't have the legacy infrastructure and we could, we could leapfrog. So my, my ambition would be that we could use um, some of the most interesting and challenging areas in um, aging and longevity um, broadly, in particular, the care crisis, um, to apply AI and to apply technology to dramatically improve efficiency. And I've, I've got an event coming up uh, in November um, with Institute on Aging, and we're bringing in a number of companies doing artificial intelligence that have very significant promise to massively scale up the ability of care managers and care coordinators to cope with uh, and manage a, a broader um, census uh, population of people and also do it better. And I think if we can drive uh, AI and, and tech to do the, the boring stuff, to do this, the synthesis of notes, the summary of meetings, the pre-population of those you know, large and complicated oasis forms that require you know, hours of um, time to create a draft uh, activity plan that can be uh, iterated and discussed between um, the, the caregiver or the, the client service manager and the individual. That's a fantastic way to start with bringing people up to their highest um, purpose. And that I think is where we need to, to dig in. Um, and I think our space in the aging space is, is ripe for that. I think the second big trend is the shifting of the care um, uh, location to the home, this idea that people want to be out and about in the community. And I think that needs to be given a nuance because we've been um, also at the same time running up against the loneliness uh, epidemic. And I think 
the evolution of new kinds of um, group and community activity, which have got more of a consumer lens um, rather than a clinical and healthcare lens. So the next generation of uh, day centers, they're the wonderful um, activity here uh, in Australia um, where they were doing a dementia dance and they've got these dementia cafes and they have people coming in a very uh, engaging, uh, inclusive model that is more about empowerment and aspiration and joy than it is about clinical management. And I think there's this idea of where will the new um, locations be and, and in what is the right, what is the right mechanism? Because I think the other thing which doesn't get talked about as, enough is that you are shifting care to the home and you're putting a massive burden on the family caregiver who doesn't necessarily have the skills. So that's a huge opportunity for growth and, and areas. And I think the last last piece around is sort of this what is a consumerization? I think sort of re reimagining what it means um, to think about the opportunities and the the, the innovation um, landscape from the perspective of older people as people, not older people as a bundle of clinical elements. And I think that is uh, evidence in some of the more interesting and successful senior living projects that have you know the individual there you know, elevating their individual the purpose. At their, at their core um, and the um, the warehousing, the, the negative um, sentiments that frankly, most of the baby boomers are, you know, clearly and, and, and understandably reluctant to get engaged uh, in, in terms of the sort of old model of care has really, the time has come for change. And we're seeing, you know, sparks individual changes, but it hasn't yet gone to the mainstream in terms of either expectations or mindset or or new business models and so i think if we can start to um bring in this sort of consumer empowerment and it is it is a, a lot about consumerization of longevity services and bringing if you like uh aging is maybe a fourth one from, from aging to longevity um and from sort of longevity to health span sort of this idea of it's not just about end of life it's not just about older people it's about activities from the whole um optimizing the whole life course um but i think it's all then about recognizing this concept of health span which is maximizing the the days um life in good health and in the sompo we've been developing the concept of the pinkoro society which is sort of based on the japanese pin pin korori um which is sort of living life uh, a full life to the very end essentially and i think this is really the ultimate goal the, what most of us are united in doing, which is maximizing uh, health span, but doing that in a, in a very different, fresh way that has a much broader remit than perhaps the age tech um, definition might otherwise suggest. Um, yeah, I mean, it's such an important question and I would, you know, as is um, my preference to look outside and see what's, uh, where has this worked elsewhere? You know, are we looking at other places that confronted, uh, confronted with a existential challenge? And if you look at climate change and the environmental movement that had a number of false starts um, and um, found itself sort of retrenching and with a lot of you know, negative um perspectives and and, and um naysayers and, and now um i mean there's obviously always naysayers and, and and there will be in any um issue but the broad consensus has really shifted and i think the um uh, breakthrough moment in many ways was um the narrative shift that we saw with greta thunberg and this idea of outrage and moral um disgust at what we're seeing and the sense that our future generations are being shortchanged by what we're seeing and, and frankly that also um goes back to the slave trade back in you know from the uk um hundreds of years ago was at the forefront of something that was normal and it was universal effectively and there was this shift this mindset shift this sense of outrage which was galvanizing and then in hindsight it's obvious um you look at um uh, the billions of um, animals that are um, um, in uh, farm factory farms today, and you can imagine that in a few years that will that will be seen as outrageous than what we were doing to our 
animals what we're doing to our climate so i think there's this sort of you know trying to bring it back a bit it's been a um interesting effort to kind of uh and exit to look at some of these ways in which narrative can come in and, and sort of right now i think i'm a bit worried that there's a bit too much sort of us versus them and it's sort of zero sum game and it's sort of older versus younger and that doesn't really help and i think there's going to be inevitable pushbacks and so i think there needs to be some good um narrative crafting of new win-win scenarios that work for uh all sorts and there are some fantastic insights and data about intergenerational teams and engaging um inclusive uh you know, inclusivity is sort of part of the uh, esg agenda which often doesn't really um uh include sort of ageism and intergenerational um, discussions as much as it should um so say there's a piece around changing how we think about um what we're doing which is actually you know a moral case and a and, and frankly existential case and it's not just um tinkering at the edges um i think there are there's also a way in which the most effective um impact um is done at the holistic level meaning we need to just take a city it takes time to start, start start with a hamlet then a, then a village then a, then a town and a city then a, then a region and say like we can change and this is why i love the blue zones model um in terms of they've um arrived at this through essentially um you know an ex external um outward sort of seeing what's working and then working backwards from why it works and this idea of holistic change models so to me it's about a political will that sort of connects the two pieces so there's a political um driver that we need that we need a, an individual or individuals who have the um ambition and the chutzpah to kind of really try to do something different and then we need a a canvas um climate kick kic out of europe um has done some quite nice models where they're taking demonstration they call demonstration models or demonstrator models they for example got into switzerland and say how can we change the entire nation to electric vehicles and they're thinking about all the different ele elements that are involved in a shift to this desirable future and looking at the different pillars whether it's regulatory changes whether it's um funding um for new research that doesn't yet exist whether it's subsidization for installing individuals to install charges in their homes um it's a much broader piece than just funding or just tech and i think it's you know so i probably need to stop beating this drum around system change but essentially if we can demonstrate it at a system level then we can then apply that elsewhere and so to me been chatting with some folks around making California the best place in the world for longevity. And you can imagine that you look at the entire lifespan and you can sort of say, what are the child, what are the programs for children when they're five years old that will impact them to when they're 95? And what are the programs for mid-career workers who are going to be bumped out of their jobs by AI and get depressed, get um, uh, unhealthy and um, die early? because they don't have um, good tools and systems and supports in an AI world. And then what is the sort of end of life palliative care nursing home model? So those individual um, vignettes are essentially demonstration opportunities, where we need to get it working and show that we've got the thing uh, operating, what I'm calling sort of minimal viable ecosystem level, the thing that work together, the outputs are, and the impacts are significant and compared to what is normal or what is sort of data status quo, it's made a difference. And then we know what to scale up. I think that sort of strategic but managed approach where we have a vision, but then we can test at a at a fairly contained model managing the parameters. And if it works, scale it up. You know, the tech companies have been doing this at, at, at their um, levels in terms of testing, scaling, testing, scaling. And I think we need to get smart about how to how to take and to scale some of these great ideas that we've been working on.